So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to listen to our fireside chat. I just want to introduce everyone I have on stage with me before we get started. To my left is David from Baxter International. We have Elena opposite me and Lou to the right. So, guys, I'd, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about innovation and regulation and why it's so difficult to innovate and disrupt in health compared to other industries. So if Eddie and I could ask you first, uh, health is a very complicated industry, much more so than, for example, consumer electronics. What exactly makes it so complicated? Well, I think as, as soon as you deal with people's lives, as well as their money, then you have to kind of have regulations in place to protect people's lives or money. And when it comes to health, that is extremely important. You cannot just you know, be careless when it comes to health because you have to make sure that you know, there's a process in place, etc. And that's where regulations come into play. So regulations are extremely important in order to make sure that innovation happens in a certain way, etc. But I think the problem comes when you know, innovation happens much faster than you have time to update the regulations. And then regulations do not only protect people, but also inhibit innovation. Mm, absolutely. What, what do you feel we lose out on as a result of the, of the system being as it is? Well, I feel like it becomes kind of um, a culture in the health space where, um, you know, there's a lot of skepticism against innovation and new things coming up. And that's not good for the longer future. Thanks. Lou, what, what do you feel would be possible if disruption became as easy and perhaps as widespread in healthcare as it is in other industries? Uh, I would say first that disruption has been never easy in any industry. So, but it's true that it's harder in the healthcare industry because of the regulation, because of the cost of the technology and the implement and integration. But I feel if it could be easier, especially for the capital, more founder coming to the stage, we'll for sure see more like unicorn company in this industry. We'll see more like a company IPO rather than directly go with the merge acquisition route. Lots of founder decide to sell the company because it's a huge challenge that continue work on it with this regulated market. Sure. What do you think we can do to try and accelerate the change as well? Uh, I think first is uh, for sure that uh, for the whole ecosystem, no matter it's regulator or capital, uh, we could do a lot. Now there's not many capital uh, prefer to invest in healthcare. If we could have more capital, more venture capitalists uh, trying to support a healthcare company, for sure will help. And also, as far as I heard, the FDA in the uh, United States, they're trying to accelerate internally to better to help the funder. And also some payer insurance company set up the venture arm to support the funder. But meanwhile, I feel on the other side, there are lots of things funder could do to help accelerate in the process. First is the attitude towards the FDA. I know lots of funder has very negative attitude towards FDA, think that's my enemy. But actually, you could make them your friend if you treat them well. If you want to make friend with someone, you need to let them get to know you first. You need to know what they want from you and prepare everything and then submit the application, they could get approved very fast. Another thing is embrace the new technology. Mm. Not just to stick with the conventional healthcare innovation, but to adopt the new technology, AI, network, security, to really accelerate in the innovation process. I saw you nodding a bit there, David. Anything to add about the, the FDA and, and regulation? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with, with, with Lou's point that in, in anything, your regulator has to be your friend, too. Mm. And the agencies are obviously there to put, a, put in the protections that, that, that were discussed earlier, but the reality is they're there to promote innovation. The FDA actually has dramatically reduced approval timelines um, for both drugs and medical devices over the past five years in order to speed innovation. They have designations like fast track, but the way to get on a fast track is to work with them mm. and, and to get to know the agency to a point where they can be an, an, an ally, not an adversary. Absolutely. Something else I was keen to ask you is, uh, and I know we've discussed it before, that change is often the result of specific needs and, and pain points. And there's lots of pain points in this sector, and there's a lot of money going into this sector as well. So do you feel it's more a case of when, not if? And if so, how long is it going to be before this happens? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, John, because if you think about disruption, I think it was in a, in a, in a previous session where disruption and innovation is about making things cheaper, more efficient, et cetera. You look at any statistic, and you would say healthcare is seen the exact opposite. Everyone knows about ballooning healthcare costs around the world, aging population, stretched government systems, et cetera, et cetera. But there actually is a ton of innovation that takes place in healthcare. I think the problem with it is that it's all seen beneath the surface. So it ends up being very specific problems that end up treating a specific disease state rather than going after uh, the, the broader system. And I think the reason for that largely stems from a lack of collaboration across all the different stakeholders. One thing that, didn't, that, that I think is, is important when you think about innovating in healthcare, you probably have more stakeholders in healthcare than any other industry. Yeah. So you want to create a new consumer product, all you have to do is create the product and sell it to, to one individual. They take out a credit card or cash and they pay for it. That's it, transaction's done. Mm -hmm. In healthcare, first of all, it varies in every single region. So you can't talk about global healthcare without going into each of the individual countries. You can't even talk about Western Europe. Each country has its own set of dynamics that, that are important. So think about, think about an industry where you have a, a patient, i.e. in this case sometimes a consumer, a caregiver, a medical professional, a payer, a government, um, infrastructure like hospitals and other, other uh, systems like that, that's a lot of mouths to feed. But each one has its own objective and its own, its own set of incentives. So I think one of the things that you're gonna see, uh, and you, you're starting to actually uh, observe this in the US, is changes in the overall environment that force these different participants to, to, um, to align around, around incentives. A lot of people talk about value-based care mm -hmm. instead of volume, which is very simply, get something out of what you're paying versus just do more of it. So that, that will force um, the right environment to, to drive innovation. So I do, to answer your question simply, I think it's a matter of, uh, yes, when, when, when not if, but it's also um, a, a challenging to focus on all the different participants. Sure. Do you feel we can afford to wait for those changes? Do we need to try and accelerate them if yeah. possible? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's also kind of like, that, that's the burning platform question. At what point will a government just turn off the faucet? Mm. And we actually saw that happen in Europe in, in 2011 during the, the, the European debt crisis where governments did literally just stop spending on healthcare. Yeah. And companies like ours um, were, were, were forced to make decisions about did, continuing to provide care. We did. Um, it is a humanitarian need to provide healthcare, so that's never a question for us. But um, that did force a lot of uh, European countries to rethink their incentive structure. So for example, um, there's been a massive shift in Europe out of the hospital into the home, which is a much cheaper site of care. Mm -hmm. And that happened through top-down regulation. So as the regulations change, that will speed up uh, innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to touch on the kind of, we have three different perspectives on the stage. So Lou, you're coming from an investor side, Elena and I see more from the startup side, and David perhaps from a more corporate perspective. I'd like to look a little bit at the, the synergies between the three and how that can contribute to, to positive change and, and speeding mm -hmm. things up. Lou, if, if I could start by asking you, as an investor, you have kind of quite a lot of extensive knowledge in terms of what's taking place with early stage health tech mm -hmm. startups, and I know you worked with your own one before, which was subsequently acquired. Yeah. I wanted to ask if, are there any emerging trends you can discuss or share with us in this space that you're aware of? Uh, sure, actually, you know, it just happened since late last year. Uh, it's about like uh, adopting the new technology into the, we call the so-called conventional healthcare industry. Mm. Now, it's all based on the big uh, thesis of personalization, like healthcare, personalization, medication. That's the trend that people are uh, trying to do. But now with the, no matter like deep learning, computer vision, and network technology, make this become a reality, we could actually use, leverage this new technology to collect tons of data from individual, tons of data from a certain group, and then do the quick analysis, get back to the patient and doctor, and mm. provide personalized uh, diagnosis result, our uh, treatment result. For example, like we always talk about computer vision, like people think computer vision has security application, this or that, but actually computer vision is a perfect solution to solve the problem for medical imaging. Long times, the problem for medical imaging is the overload of data. 
And uh, by using computer vision, we're now trying to replace anyone, like replace dot or no. It's trying to make their work more efficient, to select maybe three out of five of the image out from hundreds, and uh, help the doctor to be more accurate and also repeatable. Mm -hmm. So that's the technology it's capable to do right now. And also thought about like robotics. We saw a robot for industrial application, consumer facing. But we could use robot for surgery as well. Why we always want to have a senior doctor to do the operation? Because they have steady hand. Mm. But the machine and the robot right. could have steady hand as well. And also some technology could do the 3D live like imaging of the operation. So you can see the 3D dimension, where's the distance between the knife and the heart. That's all the things that are being enabled by the new technology right now. So what I thought is not only like the, the trend of the, this two sides work together, it's also actually occurred to me there's no, there are so many new innovation centers came out in the United States, like in San Francisco, in like uh, in Chicago is one as well, like Pittsburgh, Houston. It's because this type of innovation requires two sides of experts, software, hardware, AI, computer science, and also like uh, healthcare apps were. When I was running my company like back in 2012, by 2011, it's a conventional hardware. It's a piece of hardware collecting the bio sample. But now lots of the new company I saw is they have the hardware still important as a big sensor, maybe portable device as a smaller sensor. Meanwhile, pair with a layer of the network, uh, transfer the data to the cloud, and got the feedback right away. So that's a definitely a very exciting new trend that we're seeing happening in the early stage. And another thing I really also appreciate a lot is uh, the, the globalization of the healthcare innovation. I, I was born and raised in China, went to Silicon Valley, built up my career. So by nature, I, I want to see like, what's going to happen in the future for technology from the United States also play the role across the world. And now I saw the big trend is the founders start to realize the future competition will be globalized. Your biggest uh, competitor may outside United States. Meanwhile, your biggest market may outside United States as well. Mm -hmm. So they also leverage this uh, advantages to actually penetrate into new market faster, take advantage of potential like a cheaper clinical trial, and also get approval faster by leverage different resources. So that's another exciting trend we were seeing happening for the past year. Seems like there's certainly a lot of stuff happening, yes. lots of developments. It literally yeah. happened for the past year. year. When, I was, uh, start, when I first found this uh, New Gen Capital in uh, early 2015, it's so hard to find a co-investor for healthcare in the Valley. But all of a sudden, in the late 2016, so many funds start to put capital into the market because they saw the trends coming as well. So mm. definitely very exciting. Exciting times, yeah. Elena, I'd really be interested in hearing your experience as a founder and running your own company. It'd be really fascinating to hear how you found working in and disrupting the health industry. Could you tell us a bit more about your experience there? Sure. And maybe not everyone knows what Natural Cycles is, but it's, um, it's the world's first certified contraceptive app. So what we do is we, um, we have an algorithm that analyzes women's body temperature to detect ovulation and, and pinpoint fertility. And um, I, I found it together with my husband, and we're both physicists. I'm originally a particle physicist. So as a researcher, I was maybe a little bit naive at first because I thought, like, okay, I, I will make this product that will do something good for the world. And I, we made clinical studies that show that uh, the app is actually as effective as the pill. So mm. I thought, that's great. Life is good. Uh, but I completely underestimated what a highly protected and regulated space I was getting into. And um, after launching the product in Sweden, uh, we grew very fast the first year. And then it was when we... Um, yeah, we, we got a lot of problems because we were then a medical device class one fertility monitor because after consulting with the medical product agency and, and the notified body that audits you, that's, that's the answer we got that we should be. But when people realized that actually users use this app for contraception, then they thought, mm, but maybe then the risk class should be higher, the same medical device risk class as the condom for contraception. Mm. So it, it took us then one and a half years of a lot of fighting and work. And the hardest part was actually convincing the notify body to audit us at all for this high risk class, because they said, but you're an app. You're, you know, 
you're not a condom. A condom protects against STDs. You don't. So mm. the biggest fight was to, to be able to be considered for this higher risk class at all, uh, which the medical product agency said that we had to be. So the regulations weren't written for, uh, for an app. So we had to kind of find our own way, which we finally managed to, to get this certification at the beginning of the year, which has been a huge milestone for yeah. us and our users. Uh, and now we are trying to also befriend the FDA. <laughs> uh, so we're um, getting to know each other. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to again, kind of create our own path with the FDA to get the similar certification uh, as we have in Europe. But it's cool. not easy. Uh, definitely. It's like dating, right? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I was also going to ask that I guess founding a company is hard enough in itself. How much of your time and energy did you feel that you spent on things like regulation you would rather have spent on just building up your company and developing it? A lot, of course. Um, luckily, since we are two co-founders, uh, we can split our tasks a little mm. bit. So my husband deals more with the regulations and I, uh, I as a CTO, I deal more with you know, the technology and, and the product development. But of course, we spent so many weekends just like, oh my God, they want something now. We have to <laughs> create some kind of report that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and do, you, do you see a future kind of working with corporations for natural cycles, or are you going to focus more on developing things by yourselves, working in the, the B2C space? Well, I think since we're really on the forefront of this, um, it, I don't really see how we would work with corporations, but I do think for the sake of you know, new apps that are coming today that would want to be regulated, I think mm. like larger corporations like Apple or Google, they could really, you know, make a way for an app to go into regulation so it's not just unknown terms and you have to make things up as they go. Uh, we, we try now instead to um, you know, work with, for instance, the NHS in the UK or insurances to see how we can actually get reimbursed like other contraceptive methods are today. Yeah. But also there it's kind of like, you know, we're an app, but so we're not a medication. We, we, we never really fit in any of these boxes. And kind of a li little bit of everything, but not one exactly. particular thing. Exactly. So it's yeah. always like trying to fit like a, a square into a hole or, mm. or the opposite. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a part for challenging for FDA as well. Because what I heard is uh, there's a company, they also have a device and also app, and then submit FDA. FDA give, give back the feedback saying that there's no data showing that patient won't get hurt by using the app. You need oh. to provide data proving that. So it's like uh, they, they, they're not stupid. It just, just needs something to prevent in, if something happens in the future. But meanwhile, it sounds like stupid. <laughs> you need to prove that you won't get hurt by using the app. Yeah. Yeah. You need to prove that it's not a problem for the eye to look yeah, at the yeah. app. It's yeah. Many things like that. Sounds, sounds pretty complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask David from a, a corporate perspective or someone who's perhaps really well versed in strategy and acquisition. What your opinion is on, on more, more surprising technologies that are coming forward or entering the health space as well? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, healthcare is, is just like, it's an awesome space because it's one of the few spaces where you're actually, you're dealing with, 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 with people and you are impacting uh, people's livelihoods. Our, we have a pretty simple mission at Baxter that we really live by, which is save and sustain lives. And there's like no better feeling than when you go into a hospital and you see someone being treated and cured with, with a product that, that, you've, that, you've, you, that you've manufactured and, um, and brought to market. So that is, th there's been a huge shift in the development of technology from just treatment of a specific condition to treating, I think Lou talked a little bit almost about the continuum of care uh, new technologies that diagnose patients earlier, that find a way to treat patients um, on an ongoing basis and try to prevent catastrophic, event, catastrophic um, adverse events from taking place. So, and, I, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll give a couple specific examples, and, and uh, this is my uh, own personal, personal view, but there's, there's some technologies now in the diabetes space, for example, uh, called continuous glucose monitoring. So patients who are diabetics need to test their blood sugar levels on a regular basis. The problem with that is 
obviously that your blood sugar changes in real time as you walk, as you exercise, as you eat, as you go to slush after parties, et cetera. <laughs> so you will, what, there's now technology that will mo not only monitor your glucose continuously, but will connect to a phone. It'll analyze trends in, in, in the data. And not only will it analyze trends in the data, it'll tell all of the relevant stakeholders when something has changed, and not only when something has changed, but what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So think about if you're a parent, you send your 14-year-old off for summer, summer holiday, and, you want to, and they're diabetic, you want to know everything that's happening with them. But not only do you want to know everything that's happening with them, you want to know what to do when you see blood sugar levels spike. So the intersection of healthcare and technology, which I think Lou also kind of referenced about, machine learning, uh, AI, et cetera. It's not so much about those technologies in and of themselves, because those are very sexy buzzwords that people like to use. The reality mm -hmm. is, is how they're applied to unmet needs in healthcare. <laughs> and when you take, you know, we, you, you talk about working corporations and startups together, we, we are going to work with startups and innovative companies forever because we're realistic to know that we're not going to think of every, of every good idea that's relevant to the patient populations that we're trying to serve. So we actively, look for, for startups to partner with them because there is a, there, there is a very specific um, advantage that larger companies will always have, which is distribution. So when you're talking about interacting with regulatory bodies or government agencies or ministries of health, that, that's a skill muscle that entrepreneurs are going to have a hard time developing. And that's where a partnership becomes very, very valuable potentially to, to, to um, entrepreneurs. And I've had the opportunity over the past year being at, being at Baxter to meet tons of interesting uh, individuals developing companies and, and, and where it's a technology that quite frankly would be super interesting to us, um, but there, there, there's sort of that barrier between conception and commercialization, and that's a bridge that, that, we, that, that we can help, build, help, help cross and also one that we, we want to help cross, yeah. even if it's something that isn't directly related to our business. I spend a lot of time mentoring uh, entrepreneurs and, start and, and individuals in the startup community just because we're all aiming at the same, the, the, the same objective and where there's an opportunity uh, for, for Baxter, obviously, to, to be involved, we, we certainly uh, look for that as well. But um, there, there's going to be a continued intersection of healthcare and technology, for sure. There, there are two industries that I think, you know, everyone talks about disruption, right? Just people think disruption, you think displacing. Yeah. The reality is here, the tech industry is not going to displace the healthcare industry. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Mm. So, um, the, the, but there's tremendous synergy in collaboration and finding common areas of, of, of competencies where, where the different stakeholders can, can work together to advance a technology, a therapy, a uh, cost situation, et cetera. Sure. I have a ton more questions I'd like to ask all three of you. I'm a tad conscious of time. We only have about five minutes left. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Elena, and then we'll jump to some audience questions, is what I find fascinating about natural cycles is you're using some quite straightforward data, like your body temperature, to give incredible insight and, and really game-changing stuff. Do you see that there are any other ways or ideas of how to use this data that's so readily available to give the same kind of insight in, in different ways for health? Yeah, I, I really think we'll see more and more of this. I mean, just from a woman's body temperature, you can, you can see so much. I mean, obviously, when, when she ovulates and has when she's fertile and not, but, but also you can then see if she's likely to be less fertile in general and might need external help conceiving. Mm. You can see if she has a thyroid problem. Uh, it can, an elevated temperature can be a sign of certain cancers if it's like a temporary infection in the body. So there are yeah. infinite of possibilities. And, and I think what we all together should strive for is, is really to get a complete understanding of our bodies on an individual level. Mm -hmm. And only then can we take, you know, we can make better decisions and take preventive actions rather than the current system of detecting and treating already yeah. existing health issues. And I think we're just seeing like, the beginning of this and we'll discover more and more simple ways of measuring simple data that can open up a whole world of possibilities. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'm going to jump into a couple of audience questions now. The first one is, uh, I'll, I'll read out the whole comment, that I have a feeling that doctors are like the most risk and change averse people in the world. So how do you overcome their resistance for innovation? Maybe I could ask you, Lou, your thoughts on that? Oh, so would you mind repeat that again? Yeah, sorry, of course. Uh, the comment is that the, the audience member feels that doctors are perhaps the most risk and change averse people in the world. And they'd like to know what ways we have of overcoming this resistance to innovation 
I think Dr. it's uh, to work with uh, some founder that are willing to take risk because like that's also what I saw that uh, lots of the doctors they have the professional background they also have very good experience uh, to see that uh, the, the gap between the technology and also the how to really have the application into the real operation mm. but meanwhile they always question all the new innovation because all the new things they're gonna have lots of things that still need to be improved and uh, that's when we need some like some we call the outsider yeah. some outsider they're not within the health industry but they kind of could bring in new insight and a new idea to work with like to think about something maybe impossible but in the future could be achieved sure. yeah try to build up a team and and and, and, I, and I think it's 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 not an unfair observation but if you look at the most successful um, new ideas in healthcare, they're all founded by market research. The, the same way every other I, I idea comes about is you, you know your customer, you know your channel, and you, you know the audience that you're trying to, to whom you're trying to cater. So when I, when I meet the best startups that I meet are ones who have developed an idea by being in the field. I mean, I, I I've met a dozen you know a dozen companies here and. The number of companies that have been out to meet customers and or meet hospitals, meet physicians, is the vast minority of, mm. of those companies. And the reality is, you, those are the individuals who are going to be buying and using your product. So you want them on board very early on. And the medical medical community tends to actually move in 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 large blocks. So if you have the right physicians involved with developing a product, and you can put a, you put a brand name on it, you will have tr you have a tremendous following. It's it's mm. also um, education, right? Doctors are human beings and they, they need to, it, practicing medicine is a skill that requires repetition and training just like riding a bike or playing a sport and mm. um, one of the biggest things we do is, is training. Um, so if you think about um, any, any time, in, in, in any situation, this is, I don't think this is unique to healthcare, but the user of the product you're developing, you want them involved from conception to purchase. And as they're part of that, you will learn how to develop a product that most aptly suits that, that community. And then you can tailor it along the way to, well, a doctor in the US will think differently about this than a doctor in China, but then you go and localize it through, through, through on the ground uh, primary, uh, primary activities. Sure. Seven seconds left. Really quickly, Elena, someone else <laughs> mentions that uh, regulation is crucial. How much <laughs> do you feel this interferes with innovation? Well, from a scale of one, to 10? <laughs> Let's go from one to five. <laughs> well, I think it interferes maybe on level three and a half, so mm. from one to five. So yeah. seven out of 10. <laughs> but, but if you think the other way, like actually once you got FDA, that's your differentiation. That's right. It's good to yeah. have an FDA yeah. that once you got it, the other competitor, they will take at least two or three years to become your major competitive yeah. market. It's different from software. You I create something in the software, right. they could copy it, you right it, away. It, it becomes a stamp of approval in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a validation. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Lou, David, Elena, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of Flush and thank you everyone for listening to our talk. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.